On July 30th, 2025, a Piper Archer III, registration November 961 Delta Alpha, went down at Block Island, Rhode Island. Three people were on board. One didn't make it. 76-year-old Dan Wilson, a Montgomery County legislator and president of the Empire State Aerosciences Museum. The pilot, Carl Dahl, a man in his 80s, was badly hurt, while another passenger from Clifton Park survived with minor injuries. This is the NTSB's preliminary report, not the final word. What we're doing here is early analysis. The point isn't blame, it's learning. The flight started out as one of the most common and innocent activities in general aviation, a quick lunch run. They departed Albany International around 10.50 in the morning, heading for Block Island State Airport. If you've flown GA long enough, you know exactly the type of flight this was. The classic $100 hamburger, except in this case, it was a seaside lunch destination instead of a diner. But Block Island is not just any destination. This airport has exactly one runway, oriented 1028, and it's short only about 2,500 feet long and 100 feet wide. That's plenty for a light single like a Piper Archer, but it doesn't leave a lot of margin if things aren't just right. Compare that with Albany, where they took off, which has 8,500 feet of pavement. It's a completely different mindset when you land on a strip that's barely a third that length. The weather at the time was clear skies, 10 miles of visibility, temperature up around 30 degrees Celsius, and winds from 230 degree at about 7 knots. Sounds benign at first, but here's the kicker. If you're landing on runway 10, those winds give you both a crosswind and a tailwind. Not huge numbers, but on a short runway, even a 5 knot tailwind changes the math. And here's the truly frustrating part, runway 28 was available. Landing there would have flipped that into a headwind, adding stopping margin instead of subtracting it. It's one of those little choices that doesn't look like much in the moment, but can change the entire outcome. Now let's talk about the sequence of approaches, because this is where things really started to unravel. On the first approach, the pilot did the right thing. He saw a departing aircraft rolling on runway 28, so he wisely went around instead of forcing the issue. No problem there. The second approach didn't go smoothly either, he turned from downwind to final way too tight, setting up a poor alignment. Again, he broke off the attempt. Another good call. It's always better to go around than to salvage a bad approach. But then came the third attempt. According to the ADSB data in the NTSB report, the airplane crossed the runway threshold at 104 knots ground speed. For a Piper Archer, that's fast. Touchdown didn't happen until about 1,500 feet down the runway, meaning only about 1,000 feet remained on a strip that started out at 2,500 feet total. Touchdown speed was 83 knots, still hotter than you'd like to see in that situation. At that point, the pilot reported a gust lifted the right wing. And here's the real problem. There wasn't enough runway left to recover. No way to accelerate back into the air. No way to stop in time. The aircraft ran off the end, across the grassy overrun, and into the trees. One passenger lost his life. The others were hurt. The airplane was destroyed. Let's dig deeper into the numbers, because they really tell the story here. On paper, a Piper Archer can land comfortably on a 2,500-foot runway under normal conditions. But those numbers assume you're landing at the right speed, right point, and ideally, into a headwind. Once you start deviating from that baseline, the margins disappear shockingly fast. Take the wind, for example. The FAA and Piper's own performance charts both emphasize that a tailwind, even a mild one, has a disproportionate impact. Roughly 10% more distance required for every two knots of tailwind. That means a four to five knot tailwind, like what was present on runway 10 that day, doesn't just nibble away a little performance. It wipes out hundreds of feet of stopping room. On a long strip like Albany's 8,500 feet, that's irrelevant. But at Block Island, it's a real killer. Now combine that with speed. The ADSB data paints a pretty clear picture. 104 knots crossing the threshold. 83 knots on touchdown. For a Piper Archer, that's well above what most pilots would consider normal short field landing numbers. And here's the physics lesson. Kinetic energy isn't linear, it's exponential. 
Doubling your speed doesn't double your stopping distance. It squares it. So even being 20 knots fast can almost double the rollout. That's why the FAA stresses this point so hard. Excess speed compounds everything. Then there's the touchdown point itself. At 1,500 feet down the runway, there was only about 1,000 feet left. Add a tailwind penalty and faster than normal speed, and suddenly the math no longer works. It didn't matter that the pilot had brakes. It didn't matter that the surface was dry. And it didn't matter that the airplane itself had no mechanical problems. Preliminary checks showed the engine, fuel system, controls, all working normally. The real battle was with physics. And by the time the wheels hit the ground, that battle was already lost. But numbers aren't the whole story. Human factors always play a role. About 20 miles from Block Island, Providence Approach told the pilot to switch to the advisory frequency. That's routine, but according to the preliminary report, he stayed on Providence's frequency, even making traffic calls there. Controllers reminded him several times that he was transmitting on the wrong frequency. That's not just a clerical mistake, it means he wasn't properly coordinating with traffic actually at Block Island. And in a busy pattern with limited runway options, that's a big deal. Think about workload at this point. The pilot had already flown two unsuccessful approaches. The first was broken off for traffic. The second was abandoned after a poor turn to final. By the third try, the pressure to get it done must have been enormous. That's what we call get there That creeping sense of I've already tried twice, I need to make this one work. It's subtle, but it builds fast. Add in the radio distraction. Instead of focusing 100% on airspeed, glide path, and alignment, Part of his brain was still tied up with ATC chatter on the wrong frequency. It's not that he couldn't fly the airplane. Clearly, he did make three patterns, but it chips away at bandwidth. And when you're flying into a short strip with a tailwind, you need every ounce of focus. There's also a broader safety context here. FAA and NTSB data consistently show that unstable approaches are rarely discontinued. Only about 3% result in a go-around. That means the overwhelming majority of pilots press on even when the approach is clearly off. And let's be real, this is extremely frustrating because if you look at accident data, a large percentage of runway excursions could have been prevented by one simple decision. Pushing the throttle in and trying again, or just diverting altogether. In this case, Two go-arounds had already been made. That shows good judgment. But by the third attempt, it's not hard to imagine the pilot thinking, this has to be the one. That mindset is deeply human. And it's a reminder to all of us. Discipline in aviation isn't just about stick and rudder skills. It's about decision-making under pressure. When the airplane finally rolled off the end of runway 10, there was only a short grassy overrun about 243 feet, and then trees. The piper hit them about 467 feet beyond the pavement, inverted, and came to rest roughly 640 feet past the runway end. One life was lost, another seriously injured, and one walked away with only minor injuries. The victim, Dan Wilson, wasn't just a passenger. He was a county legislator, a museum president, and someone deeply tied to the aviation community. His loss resonates far beyond this single accident. And, for the pilot, and the surviving passenger, this is trauma that goes far deeper than the wreckage. So, what can we take away, at least in this early stage? First, the importance of a stabilized approach cannot be overstated. Correct speed, correct touchdown point, correct alignment. Second, runway selection matters. A short strip with a tailwind is unforgiving. And in this case, runway 28, with a headwind, would have been the better option. Third, every pilot has personal and aircraft limits. Recognizing when you're outside them and diverting if necessary can save lives. And finally, the discipline to go around, again, or simply divert, is one of the hardest but most important calls in flying. But let's be clear, these are early learning points, not final conclusions. The NTSB will dig deeper into performance data, human factors, and organizational context, and their final report will tell the full story. For now, this accident is a stark reminder of how small margins, speed, wind, and distance can line up against a pilot in just the wrong way.